Mrs. Roosevelt. Today I'm portraying Mrs. Roosevelt during the war years. I'm wearing a Red Cross volunteer uniform, which Mrs. Roosevelt wore during her trip to the Pacific in 1943, visiting the soldiers in hospitals and visiting the different medical facilities in Australia, Guadalcanal. Um, Mrs. Roosevelt, during her performance, talks about uh, her trip, her time meeting the, meeting the future president. They were distant cousins, fifth cousins, and uh, how she aspired and became uh, first lady. Didn't want to be, but went, went with uh, Mr. Roosevelt's wishes, and he, she knew that he wanted very badly to be president. He is our only president to have been elected for terms, four consecutive terms, served three full terms. Mrs. Roosevelt was a very reluctant first lady, but she took to the role and became her husband's greatest spokesperson and probably is our most iconic and noteworthy first lady. She uh, spoke out for the president's uh, programs during the Great Depression traveled about 23,000 miles across the United States during those years, promoting the different projects, TVA, um, the Civilian Conservation Corps, encouraging people, and took that role again up uh, as the kind of the cheerleader for the Roosevelt administration during the years of the war. After her husband's death, she would go on uh, continuing much of her work and became a, uh, an ambassador to the newly organized United Nations and served in that capacity until 1953. And then went on to write 11 books, continued speaking engagements, and wrote a daily column called My Day. Wrote that from 1937 to 1962. Her last column was completed in October of 1962. And she died November 7th, 1962. So the column was printed after her death, uh, with, along with her obituary. She, uh, as I say, is probably the most iconic first lady of all the first ladies. Uh, I was very reluctant to take her on. I'm not using her voice right now because it's very strenuous. <laughs> But she had a very distinctive voice. <laughs> and she worked very hard on controlling it and uh, took allocution lessons so that she would be a better public speaker. After her husband's death, there were many people in the Democratic Party who encouraged her to run for the Senate, and she did not want to do that. She did not see herself as a politician. She felt... She felt that she best served her fellow Americans by kind of being their cheerleader, being out there when, when they needed her. And she had certain causes that were very close to her heart. Civil rights, uh, the equality of women, uh, the care and health of children throughout the world. She was very, very intense about these causes. And after uh, leaving the White House, she actually felt more freedom to be able to express herself because she was not tied into having to constantly agree with whatever the administration did. And there were many times when she did not agree with what the administration was doing but understood that was a political situation and that's the way it had to be played. But um, she was an exciting person. <laughs>
and the beauty of the lilies. Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let us live to make men free. in this area in 1750. Uh, Courier de Bois means runner through the woods. The governor in Montreal thinks that I should buy a license from him to, in order to trade with the Indians. However, uh, he lives in a fine house, drinks fine wine, has many servants. I, on the other hand, sometimes have to drink swamp water, I live in the woods, and face dangers day to day. Uh, so I don't see that I should have to pay for his license fee. So that's where my name comes from. When the governor's men show up in the area, then I have to become a runner through the woods. These are some of the furs that uh, I trade with the Indians for. Uh, the most important one is the beaver. And I did, didn't use the whole hide. They stripped the fur off and used just the real fine under fur for making men's felt hats. Uh, this should have been the national animal rather than the eagle because it's the reason the west was explored west of the Mississippi. Uh, as the beaver became extinct around in the east, uh, east of the Mississippi, the uh, trappers and traders kept moving further and further west in, in order to follow the beaver. And it, they basically discovered the main routes over the Rocky Mountains so that the later settlers used to get to Oregon and California. Uh, this is one fairly modern beaver trap, but uh, you would set the trap in a couple feet, of, two or three feet of water, and the beaver has a gland called a caster gland. You get uh, one beaver that you'd caught previously, you'd save the caster oil, and you smear that on a stick and stick that next to the trap. Uh, another beaver would smell it, think there's another beaver in his territory, come over to check it out, and step in the trap. And his immediate uh, reaction is to dive into deep water, dragging a heavy trap behind him, and then a few a minute or so he's probably drowned. This is beaver tail. That's exactly what it looks like when it comes out of the water. Uh, with that pattern on it, probably close to double the effective surface area. It made it much more efficient for swimming. And this is what a beaver can do to a tree. hallmarked in this era with a very large hat, usually well embellished with feathers. Audubon Society was at its hallmark at this time trying to preserve the birds of the area. Um, it is marked also with very large sleeves. You can see the size of my sleeves. The skirt itself is more narrowed but tapered, but the sleeves are very large, the waist very tightly fitted. Janine here is dressed more in the Titanic era around the 1910s. It is a narrower hat, narrow sleeves, high empire waist, very narrow skirt. So she's much more streamlined. It kind of follows um, America's industrialization. Women took up much less room as time went on.
Sam Pinker in town. Sharpen knives, bend your pots. Need your shoes mended, here's the man can do it. Pinker in town. Hello, the camp, hello, the house. Pinker in town. Classical age of Greece, roughly 480 BC. And what I'm representing is a citizen soldier, Greek hoplite. If you guys have seen the movie 300 Spartans, this is what they should have looked like. The uh, uniform I'm wearing is called a panoply, would be the correct pronunciation. What I have is the dory, which is the spear, it's my main weapon. And it is held in an overhand striking position because it has a point on both ends the butt spike and the spear point the butt spike counterbalances it if it had just one weapon point it would be out of balance and very difficult to wield also this gives me two weapons that's another reason I do not fight with it from this position horizontally over the shield horizontally because I'd be poking the guys behind me. We fight in formations eight men deep, block formation. The man behind me has his shield against my back. The man behind him has his shield against his back, all the way back to the last man. That's so I cannot be pushed backwards. The formations we fight against are very typical to our own. If we are not fighting our own city-states, other Greek cities, we'd be fighting for the very popular ones, would be the Persians. The Persians invaded Greece twice. The first was at the Battle of Marathon in 490 BC. The second, 10 years later, they fought the 300 Spartans, along with 10,000 other Greeks, at the Battle of Thermopylae, otherwise known today as incorrectly pronounced as Thermopylae. It's not Thermopylae, it's Thermopylae. But anyway, the next weapon we had carry, and actually is considered a weapon, is the shield. The shield is bowl-shaped, so it rests on my shoulder. I am not carrying it on my arm. My arm is through loops on the inside, strictly to hold it close to my body. I did not swing it around. It weighs between 20 and 25 pounds, depending slight variations between them. They're all basically the same shape and same size, however. The uh, armor I'm wearing is called a linothorax, combination of linen and leather, leather core, covered with four layers of linen, linen glued to the outside and three layers on the inside. It is attached on the left hand side, the left hand side which is under my shield so it's protected so there are no openings. The yoke is a separate piece, covers the shoulders so that at the top of my body I have a double layer of armor as a thickness because when we fight the enemy is face to face, point blank, shield to shield. And with that, all the strikes at that point are then down at the shoulders and at the head and neck. So that's why the thickest part of my shield is also right here and the thick on the rim. What they did to make the shield is they glued wood side to side. After that, they put it on a lathe and bowled it out. Once it was bowled out, it was colored either in leather or a combination of leather and bronze. Neither of our shields are covered in bronze because we have lost that technology through the ages. Also, if we did have it, it'd be very expensive to reproduce right now. They are for recognition, personal recognition, because obviously all our decoration on our panoply is for personal identification, like the knights in the medieval times. If we are all dressed generically with helmets of this type covering our faces, all having round shields and all having body armor, it'd be hard to tell who is who. So each one of us can be identified by what 
our shields and our helmets and armor designs look like. A lot of times, since we are city-states, the people fighting alongside of us would be our fathers, grandfathers, brothers. For everybody but the Spartans, at age 18, you were drafted. For every male, every city-state, you were drafted at age 18. You served two years in training. After two years of training, you took the oath. And the oath, this one is in English, <laughs> but it is a copy of an actual stele and the oath on there. You became a citizen soldier. You were then as in a National Guard for your city-state. And you were eligible to be called up for service up to and including age 60. You were in very good shape. People didn't sit around and watch TV. They didn't watch videos. They didn't drive around in cars. They ate very healthy. They walked everywhere. If you had a donkey or a mule, they carried your equipment, your items. You didn't ride it. If you had a horse, it was used for war. A horse was never used for transportation except in war. It's a war weapon, and that's all it is. The uh, I am not wearing my sword. Uh, John has his. And the swords usually are short swords. Because again, we're close in fighting. If you had a three foot sword, you wouldn't be able to wield it. And the guys, you'd have to have friendly guys no closer than three feet next to you. And when you're one, you're three feet away from the friendliest guy, if you're fighting a phalanx formation like we fight in, you've got at least three other guys facing you because I've got guys on each side of me. And again, I've got seven more men behind me. Your typical uh, weaponry then consisted of the sword, your main weapon being the dory, and the other main weapon being your shield. And the weapon again is held overhand, overhead. We'd be shield to shield and attempting to strike either the face or shoulders of the opponent. And as you can see from this position is very difficult for us. And that's the purpose of our armor. Our armor protects us from face on and from a distance, I am not wearing greaves, he is. His greaves protect his shins. You can see below his shield, his legs are protected. Now from missile fire, uh, such as slings, arrows, javelins, he'd be more protected than I would. But once we close ranks with the enemy and we're fighting, I'm not gonna be looking down at his feet because if I'm looking for a place to stab him in the foot, he's obviously got a very good opportunity against me. So all our combat is up on top. We fought so close and in such tight formations that there was not a lot of casualties to begin with. It was a pushing match, shoving match, sort of like if you picture a modern day football, uh, trying to get to the quarterback. You got the one line defending, but that's a single line. Now picture that line eight men deep. And then you got another line, the, the defensive line, but they're eight men deep also. So they're just pushing and pushing and pushing. The casualties actually mounted when one side broke. When the formation was broken, you are no longer relying on the shield and the spear of the men next to you. These break up and the formation that broke turns into a mob. And with a mob and disorder, just like people have you've heard today when tragedy strikes and something happens and a mob of people go rushing out, it's confusion. People actually get trampled. Well, at this point, now I lose formation. I'm facing the enemy by myself. I lose courage. I turn around and run. I'm not fighting you. I make a very good target. The other thing being, the shield is very heavy. So in order to run faster and get away, I dropped my shield. That's why there was a saying that a Spartan mother told her son, with this shield, come home on it or come home with it. But if you come home without it, the other part of the thing that they didn't have to say is that he was a coward. He dropped his shield and ran away and she did not want her son to be a coward. So he either be victorious and come home with his shield or die valiantly in combat and be carried home on his shield.